Last week, last week I finished the teaching last week on, um, with the question, does grace, does God's grace define you? Does God's grace define you? And we talked about Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to break Ephesians 2 down a little bit more today, a little bit further today. As we walk through this series on hope, uh, I, the, the one thing that, that is lost for a lot of people, especially if you didn't grow up in a, in a religious tradition that talked a lot about God's grace, the missing element in, in our journey toward hope is grace. And it's very hard for those of us, I've talked about the baggage that we carry. If you've come out of a, out of a religious background or something like that, then the difficulty that we have with grace is that it feels like license. It feels like that, that someone's saying, just go out and live any old way you want to live. And, and that's not what grace is. That's not what grace is, and that's not what, that's not what anybody's saying. But today, as we look at Ephesians 2 again, I want to kind of break it down, and I'm going to tell you a story uh, out of Scripture. We're going to take a look at a story out of Scripture, I think, that's really going to kind of open our minds and open our hearts today. So let's take a look at Ephesians 2. Uh, if you're on the app, the new version app, it's there. If you have your, your notebooks or your tablet, whatever you want to use, or your regular Bible, whatever. Ephesians 2, verses 4 down through verse 9 says this, But God is so rich in mercy that he loved us so very much that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's special favor that you have been saved. For he, was raised, he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms, all because we are one with Christ Jesus. And so God always points us, or God can always point, us to, to point to us as examples of the incredible wealth of his favor and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us through Christ Jesus. God saved you by his special favor when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is the gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Last week, we broke this down briefly and just said this. Grace defines us as spiritually alive. In, in Ephesians 2, we see that grace defines us as spiritually alive. He gave us life. We see that we're heavenly positioned. In other words, we're seated with him in heavenly realms. We are connected to God. We're one with Christ Jesus. We're billboards of mercy. In other words, we're examples of his incredible wealth, of his favor and kindness toward us. And then he also refers to us as honored children because we're saved by his special favor. So as we look at Ephesians 2, we see this, that grace defines me, grace defines you, and grace clarifies once and for all who we are. It just clarifies it. Now, that's the introduction. Let's, let's kind of move into the body of what we're talking about today. Most everyone in this room, if not, well, not most, everybody in this room, at one point or another, you have had a label attached to you. Society just does that. It starts when, you are, when you're very young in school. Uh, you may, you may, uh, someone may call you stupid, and they may call you dumb, they may call you unproductive, they may call you a slow learner, they may call you a fast talker, they may call you a quitter. Uh, all that, and any other negative thing that you can, that you can think of, society just does that. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's which we live. When I was, when I was a kid, uh, it was, it was, uh, uh, you, you were called slow. If you had a, a learning disability, you were slow, or there was other words that we use that I'm just not going to use in here this morning. But I, I just come, I just come up with something this week that I think I need to share, and I just want to say this to you. Today, we call individuals with learning disabilities or individuals with special needs. They're special needs individuals, and, that, and that's, a broad, that's a broad term. I know that. But the thing I want you to understand here today is there's not a human being on this planet that is not a person that doesn't have special needs. Every one of us, we're a special needs individual. We're a special needs person. Every, and I know there are definitions for all that, but I just want you to understand it from this, kind of, from this situation or this perspective this morning. Every one of us, everybody on this planet, we have one very, very, very special need that overrides everything else, and that is we all have need of a Savior. Everybody has need of a Savior. Everybody has need of a relationship with Jesus Christ. So in that situation, in that, in that, from that perspective, we're all special needs. Okay, now you can take that for what it's worth, but here's the deal. You know, we all have dealt with labels. Now, not all labels are negative. Maybe you were called handsome or beautiful or, or clever or successful or talented or something like that. And, and, you've, and you've looked at those things and you've carried those labels, whether they're good or bad, you've carried them your entire life. But what I want you to, I want you to begin to think about this morning is this, that the, the resume that we carry as a Christian, 
The resume that is attached to who we are as a Christian is not defined by the labels that we've been given by society or by people in our life, but is, uh, the Christian's resume is, is, is created by grace. It's created by the grace of God in our life. Now, the story that I want us to look at today is an Old Testament story. It's in 2 Samuel. And, and to give you the backdrop of this and the backstory, uh, Saul was the first king of Israel. Saul was the king, and, and there was a point in time when he met David on the battlefield. David killed the giant, and so he became Saul's right-hand guy. He actually ultimately became the, the leader of all of Saul's armies. He was an incredibly gifted uh, military strategist. He just knew how to win on the battlefield, and he did. And there was a point in time he won this huge battle. He's coming back into town, and, and everybody along the streets are quoting, they're, they're chanting this, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Saul is slain his thousands, but David is 10,000. And Saul had some kind of issue, probably, probably some kind of mental illness or something, but it was, it was fueled by his jealousy of David that ultimately led to him trying to kill David on multiple, multiple occasions. And then finally, he took the entire army and he chased David. For 20 years, Saul tried to kill David. 20 years, Saul tried to kill David. Later on in that feud between the house of Saul and the house of David, the Philistines come against Israel, and Saul has to pull his army back from pursuing David, goes to battle against the Philistines outside of a town called Bethshan, and he, Saul, and Jonathan, his son, and two of his other boys were all killed in battle. And the Philistines took, they cut their heads off, and they took their bodies and hung them to the gates of Bethshan and, and, all, this, and, and all this kind of stuff, and, and uh, it's just a sad, gory mess that was involved there. The last son of Saul was Isbosheth. He became the king of Israel. Now, he didn't last very long at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of his servants actually wound up killing him uh, one day in his bed. <clears throat> so when Saul and Jonathan and, and his two uncles, other two uncles were killed, there was a person, a nurse, that took care of, of Jonathan's boy. And he was five years old. She picked up the boy, and she was running to protect him. And you've got to understand, when a king dies... Uh, culturally, everybody in that family got killed by the next king. That's just what happened. I mean, one king gets killed in battle, the new king comes in, kills off everybody else, sets up his own dynasty. The only way to assure your dynasty would survive is that you just wipe the other one off the face of the earth. And so the nurse, hearing that Saul was dead, Jonathan was dead, and, and all the other, she picked up the little boy at five years of age, a man to run to try to hide him, and she fell dropped him, and at five, he became crippled in both of his legs. So he lived his entire life from five years of age up crippled. He couldn't walk. He just couldn't walk. He was crippled in both feet. Now, in 2 Samuel 9, we see David has now united Israel. Isbosheth is dead. The elders of Israel, they come to David, and they say, look, we want to unite the kingdom. We want you to be our king. We know that you're anointed king over the entire house of Israel, not just Judah, but Israel, all the tribes. We want you to be the king. David does that. He defeats the Philistines. He unites the kingdom. And after he gets everything situated, kind of like what, how he wants it, he goes, you know what? He said, I made a covenant with my, with my, my good friend Jonathan when I was younger that I, I want to make sure I take care of his household. And so he asked people, he said, is there anyone of the house of Saul left? Is there anyone of the house of Saul left? So that I can show an honor to the covenant that I made with Jonathan, uh, I want to honor that covenant. Well, they looked around and couldn't find. Finally, they run across a man by the name of Ziba. He was a servant. Uh, he was Saul's servant, actually. And actually, he was, the, he was kind of the executor of Saul's estate. He, he controlled all the land and everything that Saul had left, but he was a servant doing this. And so they find him and they ask him, is there any of the house of Saul, any, any descendants of Saul left? And Ziba said, yeah, there's, there's one. It's, it's actually Jonathan's son, but he's crippled. Now Ziba doesn't tell them his name. He just gives him the boy's label. Now the boy's name is Mephibosheth. Now try to put that on a birth certificate. You know, think about that when you're, signing, when, you, when you're signing up for stuff. You've got to sign that 40 times when you buy a house or something. But Mephibosheth is the boy's name, but Ziba does not refer to him as Mephibosheth. The only thing that Ziba, the servant, refers to him as a descendant of Saul, but he says, he says yeah, there's one. It's Jonathan's son. He's a cripple. 
He's labeled. He's labeled. No name offered, just the pain that this young man has carried his entire life. So let's take a guy by the name of Mephibosheth. Where, where does a child named Mephibosheth turn? Where does he go? I mean, you, you think about this entire thing. He can't walk. He can't work. His dad is dead. His grandfather is dead. Where can the crippled grandson of a failed leader go? I mean, maybe somewhere. Maybe somewhere like No Trees, Texas. That's a real place. How about Weed, Oregon? Kind of makes you wonder what it was named after, doesn't it? French Lick, Indiana. How about Sop Choppy, Florida? Or Two Egg, Florida? Those are real places. They're all real places. Where do we find, where do we find Mephibosheth, the crippled boy? How about Lodabar, Israel? Lodabar. Where are you from? Lodabar. You know what Lodabar means? Lodabar means no pasture. Lodabar means no word. In other words, it's a ghetto. It's a place where people that don't matter get sent. That's the entire concept behind the the entire city of Lodabar. It is a ghetto city, and people that have issues, have dysfunctions, have uh, disabilities and things like that, Lodabar is where they went, where they were put. You got a young man whose name is as long as his arm, He's living in a place called Lodabar, and that's where he's stuck. Now, I wonder how many of us in this room today are acquainted with a place like Lodabar. And I'm not talking about geographically either. So, well, I, no, look, think about this. Have you ever been dropped? I'm not talking about physically. Have you been dropped by an employer? Young ladies, has a, has a guy ever dropped you in a relationship? You ever dropped a guy? Maybe you were dropped off at an orphanage. Maybe you were dropped at a hospital when you were just born. Maybe you were dropped from the team or dropped from the list. You see, at, at, at one point or another, everybody in this room, we've had some season of being dropped. But I wonder today how many of us are still residing in a place called Lodabar. I wonder how many of us, when we really think about it, we've got this stuff in our, in our background. We've got these things in our background, and we've been dropped. And because we were dropped, we now walk with a limp. And people don't remember us by name, but they remember your label. Oh, he's the alcoholic. She's the prostitute. Oh, remember her? She's the widow or the widower. Ah, that person's the adulterer or the adulteress. Oh, you mean the divorced woman? Or do you mean, oh, she's a lesbian. He's a homosexual. Oh, they're an addict. You know, the cripple from Lodabar. You walk with a limp. You have a label, and that's how you've lived your life. That's Mephibosheth's story. That's this kid's story in Scripture. And then out of the blue, out of the blue, there's a knock at Mephibosheth's door one day, and when, he, when they open the door, the palace guards walk in the door. They go to where he's laying on his bed there. They pick him up, and they put him in the wagon, and they start taking him back. And the, now, what is he thinking? They found me. And at the very least, I'm going to go to prison. But more than likely, I'm going to be killed because I am the last living descendant of the previous king. The only thing he knew was his paradigm, and that paradigm was 
I'm not, my dad, my grandfather's not the king anymore. My dad's not the king. I'm the last living descendant. And to make sure that the, the Saul dynasty is gone, David is going to kill me. That's the worst, that's the, that's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario, he's in the back of that wagon thinking, I hope I get a prison roommate that doesn't snore. Because he, at the very least, he's going to go to prison. That's the only thing he could be thinking. There's no other thing that Mephibosheth could have been thinking that minute. It wasn't one of the, hey, guys, how you doing? It was none of that. It's I'm going to die or at the very least, the best I can hope for is a prison sentence for the rest of my life. They knock on the door. They put him in the wagon. They're taking him back. But he doesn't go to the prison. He doesn't go to the gallows. He doesn't go to the executioner. Mephibosheth is taken to the palace, and he's picked up, and he's carried into the palace, into the king's banquet room, and seated at the banquet table is a name tag with his name on it, and he's placed at the king's table. 2 Samuel 9, verse 11, and from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly with David as though he were one of his own sons. From the ghetto to the palace. From obscurity, nobody knew his name. They just knew him as a cripple to royalty. From having no future whatsoever, he's now seated at the king's table. That's a huge move for a cripple boy from Lodabar, isn't it? It's a giant move. That's a, that's a, that's a leap. Now, here's the thing. Mephibosheth models our journey, your journey and mine. He's the model of the journey that we're all on. Mephibosheth's story in Scripture is a reminder for every one of us that God has lifted us from a dead-end street in Lodabar and set us at his table. As a matter of fact, that's what Ephesians 2 verse 5 says. It says we are seated with him in the heavenly realms. We're seated with him. Who? God. Jesus. We're seated with him in the heavenly realms. Now, marinate on that for just a minute. Think about that. Let, it, let that sink down deep inside of you for just a minute here this morning. And the next time circumstances try to define you by the struggles that you had yesterday or last year or last month or 10 years ago, the thing that we've got to begin to do is reach for this big glass of God's grace and we've got to drink and we've got to drink deeply. Not a sip. Not a sip of God's grace. But we need to be, we need to be immersed in the grace of God for us. Because Mephibosheth is a model for the journey that each and every one of us are on. From obscurity to the palace. From the labels of society and the labels of our circumstances and the labels of our past to a place at the king's table. No more looking at him as the cripple, but now as though he were one of David's own sons. Grace defines who you are. Not your circumstances. Not your circumstances. You know, one of the things that, that I think we need to begin to try to adjust to in our mind is this. People have said things about us. They've said things about you. They've said things about me all of our lives. they put labels on us. They've tried to shove us into, into Lodabar. They've tried to shove us into the ghetto. They've tried to shove us into a place, told us we were no good, told us we'd never amount to anything, told us we were ugly, we were fat, we were, we were, we were just, just not, not desirable in any way. We've been dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped, and we walk with a limp. And all these things, all those, the, the walking with a limp is very real because you can't, I know words, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never hurt me. I don't know who thought that up, but they need to be hit with sticks and stones because words hurt. Words hurt, and we carry the scars of those things. We carry the scars of labels our entire life when we walk with a limp because of what people have said. But you know what? Here's the truth of the matter this morning. People have no clout over us unless we give it to them. People have no clout. Only God does. Only God has clout with us. If we will, if we will listen to what God says, and according to God, according to the creator of the universe, the one who spoke the worlds into existence, who created every bit of this in, in six days and rested on the seventh, the one who made it all 
Look, the God of the universe, according to him, you are his, period. You're his, and you're seated with him in the heavenly realms. Now, you can listen to people if you want to. You say, well, but it's just easier to listen to people because they're here and they have flesh and blood, and I hear their voices, I hear their voices, I hear their voices. So what do we got to do? We got to get off that frequency and begin to get on, and tune into the frequency that God says when God speaks over us, that you belong to me. Look what, he, look what he says about you and I. Look what he says here. Ephesians 2, verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. Not not chicken scratch on a napkin or doodling on a napkin over lunch. God took time with you and I. He took time with you and I. He formed us. He made us. And he says, you are my masterpiece. Now, I want, I want, suppose Mephibosheth had seen this verse. Now, Ephesians hadn't been written yet, but suppose something like that had been said to Mephibosheth 3,000 years ago. Suppose somebody in Lodabar would have said to him, look, Mephibosheth, don't get discouraged. Maybe you can't dance. Maybe you can't run. Maybe you have to watch others kick a soccer ball from the window. But listen, God wrote your story. He chose you to be a part of his drama. And 3,000 years from now, your story is going to stir an image of grace for some readers in the 21st century in a place called Niceville. What if someone had said that to him? Would Mephibosheth have believed it? I don't know. I don't know. Having, having been labeled in my life, I can tell you that labels are very, very hard to move past. We carry them. We think we get past them sometimes, and then the voice comes back out of nowhere, and you seem to be right back in Lodabar again. So I don't know if Mephibosheth would have listened or not, but I can tell you this. My hope and prayer for you in this house today is that you will listen. My hope and prayer today is that you and I will take heed to Mephibosheth's story and understand that the, the people around us that have said the things to us and done the things to us and the limp that we walk with, those things do not define us. Only what God says about us defines us. You are God's masterpiece not just a mere painting. You're not something that he sketches out and puts some, some watercolor or some oil on, on a canvas and sticks it in a closet somewhere and goes, well, I got that one done. No, you're on display. You're on display by God. Why? No, listen, look what, it, look what it says. You are on display by God. For God always points to us as examples of his incredible wealth and favor and endless and kindness toward us. We're examples of God's favor. A hundred years ago or more, actually well over a hundred years ago, probably closer to 150 years ago now, there was a Scottish inn uh, on, on the, the seashore. And there was a group of fishermen that had been fishing that day, and they came in. And how many, how many, of, you know if, how many of you know fishermen? How many of you like to fish? How many of you like to fish? There's a few of us in here. How many of you know that when, when you catch fish, you, you, you show your fish, but when, you, when one gets away, the more you tell the story of the one that got away, the bigger that fish gets? I mean, it could be a minnow. You tell it four or five times, and it's Moby Dick. I mean, just, <laughs> that fish was this big. It was bigger than the boat, and I thought the boat was going to sink, and, and actually it was probably six inches long or something like that. Well, there was a group of Scottish fishermen in, in this inn, in this pub, and they were talking about this fish. And one guy was telling, he was describing how big the fish was, and he threw his arms out like this, and the, and the waitress was walking by, and she had a tray, and he hit the tray, and, and the teapot full of, full of uh, tea just went all over a freshly painted white wall in the pub. And just tea splattered, and it just dripping down the wall, and, and the, the innkeeper, the pub owner, came out, and he goes, man, he said, I just painted that wall, and now I've got to paint it all over. And in the corner of the pub... There's this old gentleman, said, older gentleman said, and he said, he said, hang on just a minute. Would you, would you let me work on this for a few minutes? I mean, you've got nothing to lose. You're going to have to repaint it. But let me see what I can do with this mess. And the, the innkeeper, he just goes, okay, well, whatever. He said, I've got to paint it. If you want to try to do something with it, go ahead. So the old guy went back over to his table, and he pulled out this, this box, this box. He had a, a thing he had, and he opened it up, and he set it on the table next to him, and he pulled out some brushes, pulled out some pencils, and he started working on this 
blob of tea on the wall. And they started sketching some stuff out, and they started putting some paint and some brushes and some linseed and some pigment and everything, started doing it all. And, and, and over a time, an image began to appear. And sometime later that evening, he stepped away from it. He took his brush, and he wrote his name at the bottom. He stepped away from it. And where the blob of brown tea had been, now there was this beautiful picture of this giant deer with these massive antlers. I had the same dream from time to time. Um, you know, I just do. Being a deer hunter, you just, you know, this giant, beautiful stag with these massive antlers. It's a beautiful picture. And this old guy, he just puts his brushes and his pencils up. He pays for his tab, and he walks out the door and walks into the night. And they all walk around. They're crowding around this, this painting on the wall here where there was this horrible-looking tea stain. And down at the bottom of the picture there, he, he put his name, Sir Edwin Landseer. Now, some of you may know him. Most of you probably never heard of the guy been dead for probably close to 100 years. But in the 19th century, he was the premier wildlife painter. That's what he did. He painted wildlife in oil paints. Sir Edmund Landseer took a blob of brown tea stain on a white wall and turned it into a beautiful masterpiece, a beautiful work of art. I'll tell you that story to help you understand this. God does the same thing with you and I. God does the same thing with you and I. In his hands, in Edwin Lancier's hands, a mistake, tea pitcher against the wall, became a masterpiece. God's hands do the same over and over and over and over in our life. He draws together, pulls it all together, the messed up, the dysfunction, the labels, all of the blotches in our life and he turns them into an expression of his love. And I give you this scripture again to illustrate this. God can always point to us as examples of the incredible wealth of his favor and kindness toward us. You see, what determines your identity? What defines you and I? The day you were dropped or the day you were carried to the king's table? The choice is up to you. The choice is up to you and I. We, we decide. God has already decided. We've got to determine whether or not we're going to live in that. If we receive God's work and we drink deeply from his well of grace, as grace sinks deep into our soul, Lodabar becomes a dot in the rearview mirror. The darkness of our past, the decisions that we made, the sin, the mistakes, all the problems that we've had in the past, none of those things stay with us unless we hold to them. God's grace takes the blotches of our life and turns them into a masterpiece. The past doesn't define you anymore. You're supposed to be in the palace now. Max Lucado, I read a lot of his books, and just about every one of he's ever written, actually. And he wrote a book years ago called In the Grip of Grace. And one of the most impacting books I've ever read. But in there, Lucado says this, as grace infiltrates, criticism disintegrates. The more of God's grace comes in. You know you are not who they say you are. You are who God says you are. People hold no clout. You're spiritually alive. You're heavenly position. You're connected to the Father. You're billboards of mercy. You're an honored child. Yeah, but I've got it. Look, your deeds don't save you. Your deeds don't save you. Your deeds won't keep you saved. The only thing that saves you and the only thing that keeps you saved is God's grace. That's it. Remember last week I talked to you about the big brother and how the big brother was always criticizing the younger brother about his robe and his ring and all that kind of stuff? The next time a big brother comes into your life and tries to pull you back into the chains and bondage of legalism with some legalistic set of rules and even a label, I want you to remember this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. I am a child of the king. I am seated at, in the palace. I am at the table with the king. I am seated with him in the heavenly realms. Grace defines me. Grace defines you. Grace clarifies once and for all who we are. So today, guys, listen to me. 
Turn loose of Lodabar. Turn loose of the ghetto. Turn loose of all the labels. You say, but yeah, but I, I've got this limp. Look, the limp is going to be there. Look at Mephibosheth in, in verse 9, 11, and then through verse 13. From that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly with David as though he were one of his own sons. And the last phrase there in that verse, verse 13, says, and he was, still, he was crippled in both feet. Look, you're still going to walk with a limp. You've still got issues. We all have scars, but they don't define us. They don't determine our destiny. Mephibosheth, even though he was crippled, had his feet under the king's table, and when people walked up, they couldn't tell he was crippled. They didn't know. They didn't know. He ate as one of David's sons for the rest of his life. And I don't know about you guys, but that story gives me hope. With all the stuff that we carry and all the stuff of our past, we set those things aside and we let grace define who we are. And grace defines us as an honored child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of the universe. Amen?